In the city of Mondstadt, there exists a rather surprising legend which tells of the story of the Red Knight of the Stormbearer Mountains. It goes something like this. The acting Grand Master of the Knights of Favonius, Jean, enlisted the help of the knights under her command to quell a force of invading hilly churls, pressing an attack against the City of Freedom, together with an explosive specialist often referred to among their ranks as the Spark Knight. The knight's defense was successful. In fact, the rest of the knights didn't have to so much as lift a finger. All which ended up being required of them was to stand in place in awe as enormous chunks of rock were blown loose from the mountainside, crushing the invading force. The face of the Stormbearer Mountains was forever changed. The explosions decisively ended the battle without a single injury to the Knights of Favonius, which in theory would be great if terraforming the mountainside had been the actual intent of the operation. In reality, the acting Grand Master had given a little bit too long of a leash to the Spark Knight, who had recklessly placed too many charges along the route the Hilly Churls were pressing their advantage along. After this event, the legend was born, but the details remain somewhat foggy, often overlooking the fact that this destructive force is wielded by a child, favoring instead a tale which paints a picture of a powerful knight enshrouded by a red cloak and wielding the greatest treasure in the Knights of Favonius arsenal. As was just established, the scale of the explosion at the Stormbearer Mountains and its subsequent after effects were a surprise to the onlooking knights in the moment, but it wasn't really much of a surprise, since their explosives expert is the child of the eccentric writer of the Tevat travel guide, Alice. The child I'm speaking of is the one known to all in Mondstadt as Klee. Since Klee's birth, the renowned author, alchemist, inventor, and adventurer Alice spent much of her time with Klee, teaching her everything possible about the crafting of explosives. Everything from the construction and proper placement of destructive bombs to the creation of beautiful fireworks. In this way, Klee came to idolize her mother and believes adamantly that there is nothing she cannot do. Alice even taught Klee how to identify the load-bearing points of Star Snatch Cliff, so she could bring the whole thing down in one go, if she pleased. However, that particular lesson may have been born out of her desire to vicariously experience the refacing of the cliffside since Alice is on record as having the belief that Mondstadt would be far more beautiful if the jagged edges and cliffs were destroyed, producing a far flatter and more appealing landscape in her eyes. And also, because Alice's request to do this herself was quickly dismissed by the Knights of Favonius. She may have been hoping that her daughter's lack of consideration or accountability as a child would get the job done for her at some point. It seems, however inspirational Alice is to her daughter, she isn't really the best influence on her, a sentiment that is agreed upon by many in the Knights of Favonius, most of which have had some sort of run-in with Alice or Klee in one destructive way or another. Jean is frequently inundated with stacks of reports detailing damages caused by Klee's bombs all throughout Mondstadt. Carts blown sky high and forest fires which test the very limits of the Knights of Favonius' abilities to contain are just the tip of the iceberg that represents Klee's destructive tendencies. Jean often thinks to herself, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Although Albedo, Klee's adoptive brother, is the first to remind Jean, as well as the rest of the knights, that they should all be thankful that Klee's current destructive efforts pale in comparison to the terrifying power and seriously questionable destructive thoughts which flow forth from Klee's mother Alice. These thoughts don't only include the aforementioned destruction of Star Snatch Cliff, but also several failed attempts to launch Hilly Churls via explosives to Celestia, which only reached the outskirts of Springvale, much to the dismay of the residents there. And let us not forget Alice's suggestion of a perpetual motion power facility, which could be constructed in Dadaupa Gorge by tossing Hilly Churls, which reside there, inside a spinning ball powered by their own movement. Oh, and did I mention the part where she wanted to have the older and weaker hilly trolls ground up and fed to the younger, stronger specimens? To her credit, at least, the Tower of the King of Gales is a great deal easier to climb today, after Alice blew up several of the arches, making each level much more accessible. She even admired her work, as noted in her writings, stating that the ruins felt much more ancient afterwards. Despite all of her terrible ideas, Alice isn't all chaos and destruction. 
She loves her daughter and cares deeply for her. In fact, the doll Klee carries with her at all times was carefully crafted by Alice as a gift. Dangling from the four-leaf clover pendant on Klee's oversized backpack, Alice knew that Klee would bond closely to the doll, as she has an affinity for all fuzzy things. And right, she was. The doll became her daughter's first real friend. Klee named it Dodoko, which she says means Klee's best friend. Although Klee does often bestow the title of best to just about everyone she likes. Taya is the best! Amber is the best! Master Jean is the best! Lisa is the best! Bennett is the best! Diona is the best! Mona is the best! Sucrose is the best! He's one of the weird grown-ups. He's so grumpy all the time. Why does he never smile? Klee and Dodoko became inseparable best friends, much to Alice's delight, providing valuable peace of mind for what was to come next for Alice and her husband. Three years ago, they entrusted their young daughter to the care of the Knights of Favonius prior to departing Mondstadt. Klee doesn't really know much, seemingly, regarding the circumstances of their departure, simply stating that they're on an adventure far away. Alice had crafted the little fuzzy doll with the intent that Klee always have a friend and confidant when she was alone, likely knowing that she and her husband would depart the City of Freedom, leaving Klee to grow up without parents for many years. For what it's worth, with Albedo, Jean, and the rest of the knights looking out for Klee, she is in good hands. Albedo spends much of his time daily using his alchemical prowess to repair Klee's handiwork, which is usually the damaged or destroyed possessions of the citizens of Mondstadt. But when he isn't available, Klee often winds up placed in solitary confinement by Jean, which wouldn't be so bad in theory. If the room Jean contained Klee in actually existed, I mean, what? This isn't even a room. It's maybe a broom closet at best. The door looks like it goes nowhere. There's supposed to be a room there. What the heck? I digress. Jean generally banishes Klee for a day or two to provide her with the time to consider her actions whenever she stirs up trouble, which oftentimes is just within a day or so of the previous infraction. Klee doesn't really seem to learn much from her time in solitary confinement, but that's likely due to the fact that she uses much of her time there to dream up new gunpowder formulas to try out upon her release, or thinking about which pond has the most fish available to blast in it currently, and sometimes she even considers simply blowing out the walls of her confinement room and escaping back to the lush fields of Mondstadt. But the sometimes scary nature of Jean prevents such actions. Regardless, Klee time and time again, despite full well knowing what the resulting punishment of using her bombs for purposes other than aiding the knights to protect the city will be, continues to scurry off into the lands and lets her bombs fly. She's even gotten other knights into trouble. In one such instance, Noelle mistakenly interpreted Klee's intent to play with bombs as some kind of combat training the Knights of Favonius use. Because of her dutiful nature and deep desire to prove to Jean and the Knights that she is capable enough to become a fully-fledged knight herself, she took Klee up on the offer, achieving quite the opposite. When Jean arrived to see what sort of damages Klee had caused this time, she discovered Noelle was right there with her, fearlessly tossing bombs all about as if there was no inherent danger at all, landing her in solitary confinement right there alongside Klee. Everything up until now makes it seem as if Klee is a real handful, which is, yeah, okay, it's true. She is a handful. Come on, look at what happened to this guy. He ended up very dead, but who cares? He's one of the bad guys. They don't count. They are the bad guys, right? At least we think they are. Let's just move on. Where was I? Okay, so yeah, Klee is a handful, but she means well. That is to say that Klee doesn't really grasp the scope of danger that comes with her bombs. Even after receiving the somewhat clear instructions from Kaya, which at least state that explosions can hurt people, Klee's ignorance to the intent and nature of her bombs might have something to do with the fact that even as a baby, Klee was never afraid of explosions. Or even the sound of explosions which are reasonably and understandably off-putting to everybody. Honestly, it seems probable that Klee will indeed grow up to be very much like her mother, even in the absence of her presence and continued tutelage. 
As Jean said, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So it would seem that by Klee's very nature at birth, she was tempered to work with bombs. In fact, her passion for bombs is quite innocent overall. Even after this guy exploded, she was understandably distraught over the thought of having killed somebody, even if accidentally. Mr. Fluffball was only a thief. He didn't deserve to blow up. Oftentimes, whenever Klee accidentally destroys something, she usually tries in her own way to make up for the damages or attempt to repair any damaged goods. But as she is a child, she often ends up just making things worse. In one such attempt to make up for her reckless tendencies, she attempted to apologize by making some barbecued fish which we can be certain she blasted herself, as fish blasting is among Klee's favorite pastimes. But without thinking, she attempted to light the stove using what else? Her bombs. Destroying the stove entirely, and causing much more damage for the Knights of Favonius in the process. This wasn't even the only time she'd destroyed a portion of a standing structure. The details of exactly when this occurred aren't known. But during Klee's first solo bomb creation, she was attempting to make a bomb which she described as even bigger than super big. But it didn't exactly go as planned, resulting in the complete destruction of her personal workshop. It wasn't all bad though, at least not from her point of view. Looking out over the cinders of her former workshop, a flaming pyro vision emerged and presented itself to Klee. She feels as if this was a gift from Barbados for a job well done. But really, Klee doesn't understand how or why the vision came to her at all. But still, she treasures it greatly. She would never dream of giving it up or taking it for granted, despite her childish and carefree nature, much to the dismay of the Knights of Favonius, who now have to worry about how much more potential for destruction Klee gained after the acquisition of her vision. Regardless of Klee's propensity for getting into trouble, her unyielding positivity and innocent enthusiasm allowed her to forge a tight bond with each and every member of the Knights of Favonius. Klee frequently uses the Knights' laboratories to create new bomb fuses and gunpowders under the supervision of Lisa. She's helped Amber improve the explosiveness of her Baron Bunny dolls, and has even collaborated with Sucrose in several failed attempts to transmute her Jumpy Dumpties into harmless versions with legs, which would enable them to dance for the entertainment of all. Even the more mysterious knights, like Kaya, do their best to help keep Klee out of solitary confinement, although he might actually be trying to help her make trouble. Who knows with that guy? Klee. Seems she has failed to elude the acting grandmaster's investigative skills. Despite the pointers I gave her. <laughs> I'm kidding. No need to go reporting me or anything. In truth, the efforts made by the Knights to shield both Klee and the city of Mondstadt from the power of her destructive forces may work a bit too well. The legend of the Red Knight who altered the face of the Stormbearer Mountains has painted a picture to some among the general populace that Klee is the strongest fighter in all of Mondstadt. The tale is often told in the Angel's Share, and the talk of the strongest fighter is fiercely debated amongst those in the ranks of the Adventurer's Guild. Often, they cite the legend as evidence of the Red Knight's strength when comparing them to Jean or Deluc. It should be noted, though, that most have no clue that the title belongs to Klee as a result of Jean and Albedo's growing capabilities in the arena of damage control. But to be fair, the legend might not exist at all if the residents of the City of Freedom weren't often intoxicated. A fact which prevented the civilian bystanders who witnessed the explosions from properly interpreting what they witnessed the night of the Hilly Churl raid with even a remote degree of clarity. Strongest fighter in Mondstadt or not, Klee is not a burden when it comes to her duties as a Knight of Favonius. Her talents are valued and utilized when appropriate to help protect the city, as was seen during the events of the aforementioned legend. Klee, for all her desire to have fun and play with bombs, just wants the word of her powerful bombs and beautiful fireworks to reach her mother's ears, so that she may be proud of her in whatever far-off corner of Tavat she's currently adventuring in. Klee's origins, like so many others in Tavat, leave a lot to the imagination. For instance, the fact that she and Alice are both likely elves of some kind, and are there more like them out there? Also, who even is Klee's father exactly? 
For now, we don't have answers to these questions, but with time, all shall be made clear. What do you think of the Spark Knight Klee? Do you think by the lore of Genshin Impact depicted thus far that she is the strongest fighter in Mondstadt? Or do you believe that that title should be held by another in the City of Freedom? Also, where do you think Klee's parents might have gone? And what events may have transpired which have kept them away from their energetic fireball of a child for so long? Are they out protecting Mondstadt by fighting threats originating in other regions? Are there other elves in Teyvat other than just Klee and her family? I'd love to hear your thoughts on Klee, as well as her parents, in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and don't forget to click the bell icon so that you are notified when my next video goes live. Lastly, join the Teyvat Historia Discord server to discuss Genshin Impact's lore, mechanics, or even exchange your theories with the community members. Thanks for watching Tavot Historia. May the seven guide you, travelers.